Bill mentioned, my name is Jay Edenborg, and I'm the marketing director for McGough Construction, and I will serve as the moderator for our session today. Uh, let's start by introducing our panel of experts here, um, and I will start on the Carlton side. Martha, you want to go first and introduce yourself? Certainly, Jay. Thanks very much. My name is Martha Larson, and I'm the manager of Campus Energy and Sustainability at Carleton College. Uh, part of my role is to manage uh, capital projects that relate to energy and utility uh, work at Carleton. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Mitch, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Mitch Miller. I am the maintenance manager at Carleton. I work with Martha and support her projects and when the projects are done, I'm the one that's responsible for day-to-day -day operation and maintenance of the campus. All right, thank you, Mitch. Uh, Tim, where you go? Thanks, Jay. Yeah, good morning, Jay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Tim Eichmann with McGough Construction. I head up our power and infrastructure sector uh, within our industrial team. I've been in the industry for 24 years now and on the construction side for about 12. So happy to be uh, with you guys today and participate in the discussion. Great, thanks, Tim. All right, Nate. Good morning, everybody. Thanks, Jay. Uh, Nate Kruger, Senior Project Manager at McGough. I've been in the construction industry for about 18 years, the last 10 uh, with McGough, and have been a part of this four going on five year journey with, with Carleton. We have just a few, um, few things today that we thought we'd share with the group. Let's see if we can, let's see, oops. There we go. And then uh, let me know if for any reason that's not showing up. Looks good, thumbs up. Okay, um, we thought it would be useful just to give a little overview of this project. It is fairly technical, but the story behind it is pretty straightforward actually. Um, and this will just kind of help to set up our panel discussion and our Q&A. A little bit about Carleton College. We are 45 minutes south of Minneapolis and we are a private liberal arts college. So we own and operate all of our own equipment. And that equipment serves about 2 million square feet of built space. Most of that, I'd say 1.8 million square feet of that is served by a campus district energy system, meaning we, we make the heating and cooling sources at a central plant and send that out to campus, all the campus buildings through a network of piping and tunnel systems. Um, we also uh, provide our own electricity grid. Um, and Carleton has had experience with sustainability projects in the electricity realm by uh, incorporating two commercial sized wind turbines. But we hadn't really had uh, sustainable ways of addressing heating and cooling until this project. Carleton is a member of the Second Nature Climate Commitment, which was a, a 2007 commitment between about 700 schools to develop a climate action plan that would make our campus a net zero carbon campus by a specific date, which we were allowed to choose. Carleton chose the year 2050 for that. And we proceeded in 2011 to write a plan on how to do that. But we were pretty inexperienced at what that would take. And so the things in our plan, some of them did come to pass, but the project that we'll be talking about today um, was really hardly in our sights at this time in 2011. And it has evolved over the past 10 years. How are we doing on that goal? We're actually doing really well, thanks to the two wind turbines and the greening of the public grid. That's been where we started to make a lot of progress. But you can see a big dip in this last year. Um, we are now 54% less carbon intense than we were in the baseline year of 2008. That's a huge reduction for a higher ed institution of our size. And um, that last dip is due to the geothermal project that we're talking about today. And actually that's only phase one. So we did this in two phases and we are still this summer going to be in the process of completing phase two. So we expect to see this um, carbon reduction drive down even further. And when we talk about carbon counting at Carleton, carbon inventory, it's really these three scopes. Um, we won't be addressing scope three today. Those are program related emissions having to do with air travel, commuting and other activities of the college. But the project addressed, uh, looked closely at really scope one, the fossil fuels that we burn on site and the emissions related to that. And for us, that's mostly our boilers burning natural gas for heating. Uh, we had the opportunity to look at this really closely because we were asked to develop, Mitch and I and our, our uh, supervisor were asked to develop a utility master plan. 
And that plan merged three key objectives. Number one, we had a number of pieces of large central plant equipment, namely a 1954 steam boiler and some of the related steam equipment and steam distribution piping that was aging and outdated, some of it 70 to 100 years old. And we knew we needed a plan to address replacement of those items. Number two, Carlton had just published a facilities master plan, which said, what will we build, what will we demolish, and what will we renovate over the next, let's say, 20 to 30 years, which allowed us to do utility planning in a very informed basis. We knew exactly what we could expect in terms of square footage over the next two to three decades. And third, as always, our goals to reduce operating costs and carbon emissions permeated this project. Um, this was a project that really did achieve this third goal significantly and permanently. So what was the utility master plan all about? Uh, primarily, it was a decision point for Carlton. Should we maintain the existing steam heating system, replace these large pieces of equipment in kind, or should we transition at this moment to from steam to low temperature hot water? And by low temperature, we mean 120 degree hot water. Use that for heating our campus and tie together our heating and cooling systems, which I'll talk in a minute about why that's important. But we used MEP Associates out of Rochester, an engineering firm that has experience with this type of work. And we looked at cost, carbon, and energy. So a three-legged stool over 30 year time frame to evaluate this comparison. And as you know, we're on this webinar today because we went with the alternative to take this moment in time to transition to 21st century technology campus-wide. Um, why would we do that? I think we got asked that question quite a bit in the beginning. Why would you take on such a large transition? Well, to simply put it here, and uh, we had a wonderful um, graphic design firm that helped us figure out how to talk about this. Um, we have our plant, our central plant and our buildings and the campus energy distribution system, that series of heating and cooling pipes is what allows us to deliver that energy out to the campus. And to do that, we produce energy at the plant. We have the wind turbines and we bring in uh, power from the power company and we produce steam in our boilers. In addition, there's energy in the buildings that I'm gonna call free energy. This is from people, from electronics, from lighting, from computers, from the solar gain. And that's all free energy, but sometimes there's too much of that free energy. So especially in the summer, we air condition, we send out a cooling uh, loop to pull that energy out of the buildings. And what do we do with it? Well, we threw it away. In the old system, we would pull that energy out in our cooling um, loops and then through the cooling tower, just throw it into the atmosphere. We also had a lot of waste energy through the stack because our steam boilers were about 70% efficient, meaning 30% of the uh, fuel that we put in was exhausted. So the new system, we still produce energy at the central plant. We still have campus distribution, except it's now hot water instead of steam. And we still have all this free energy being generated in the buildings. But now we have an energy exchange where instead of throwing the extra energy away, we're able to store it in the ground through the geothermal bore fields or just directly repurpose it to places where it's needed on campus. So if we pull heat out with the air conditioning system, we put that into the heating system and use it even in the summer to heat a pool or to heat the showers or to heat um, you know, spaces that have to be overcooled for humidity reduction. And what does that do then to the system as a whole? the produced energy goes down dramatically. So we need to produce less energy because we're able to store and repurpose so much energy, both, both the energy we produced and the free energy that we're getting inside the buildings. And this is just what that looks like a little more technically. There's a device called a heat pump in the plant. Now we have a satellite plant that houses that. And that's really where this exchange of energy happens between the cooling loop, which is air conditioning our buildings, the heating loop, which is heating our buildings, and the geothermal bore fields, which are helping us regulate that storage and dispersion of energy as needed. And then graphically, just what this looks like in terms of how much energy are we recycling? The old system, again, the heating and cooling were completely separate systems. So if we had too much heat, we would throw away the waste from the cooling. And in the heating, it was completely disconnected. 
now the geothermal system can provide uh, both that yellow bar is the heat that's directly pulled out of cooling and put into heating, or we can draw from the geothermal oil fields, which are the light orange and the light blue. And that's about 70% of our annual load, but we did not build a 100% geothermal system. It was not cost effective, and we didn't want to build a system so big that it would satisfy the hottest peak of summer and the coldest peak of winter. So we trim this system with traditional technologies. The dark red lines there are bars are um, traditional, more traditional hot water condensing boilers, very highly efficient boilers. And the blue, the dark blue, is just a little bit from our existing electric chillers that tops off in the summer when it gets really, really hot. So this gives us a lot of flexibility. The other reason we made this transition now, we had the opportunity, and being on a hot water system is much more flexible than being on a steam system because we can engage with so many other technologies. We can make 120 degree water with solar thermal panels. There's no way we could make 330 degree 80 PSI steam using solar. Um, furthermore, uh, moving to a more electric based system allows us to engage in the greening of the electric grid. And it's a more reliable way to look at carbon reduction for the long term. So that electrification goal is also part of the mix. So that's why we did this project, but why now? We could have sat and thought about this project, I think for 10 or 15 years, if we hadn't had a trigger. And the trigger for us was the construction of the Evelyn M. Anderson Hall of Science. This was a project designed by EYP architects and engineers and built by McGough Construction. And Carlton was already in the process of designing this building when we realized that the utility master plan, the transition to hot water was beneficial. So we merged these projects together, and then the utility plan really said to ride along the timeline of the science building, which was much more accelerated. The key driver there was the ability to excavate one level further and put the new East Energy Station equipment, the geothermal equipment, below the brand new science building. Uh, there are two reasons this is valuable. One is the sciences are the most energy intensive buildings on campus. So having the head end equipment right below those buildings is beneficial. The second thing is that geographically, the science complex is at the very center of Carleton's uh, district energy system. There's what the East Energy Station looks like inside, lots of pumps and, and uh, equipment. And this is where it lives on campus. So the photograph in the middle is the science building, smack dab in the middle of the campus grid. Furthermore, the three bore fields, which were done in spaces that are green space and will always be green space. So the, the two on the left are in quads and the one on the right, which is a different shape because those are horizontal bores. That's a soccer field. So there are only certain places where we could put geothermal well fields and they happen to align perfectly with the campus grid and the science building. Here's a little picture of the mess we made in the middle of campus, just to show you that this was quite an endeavor. It looks so clean on a diagram, but here we are um, installing some of the piping in the geothermal bore fields. And uh, the, the picture on the right shows how they lay out once they're drilled vertically, what, 520 feet vertically, there's horizontal piping that connects all those borings together. So it's quite a process. These are closed borings. They are not exposed to the earth or the groundwater. Um, the piping just forms a network that then runs to and from the plant. And McGuff really worked hard with us and MEP associates to phase this project in a way that made sense. You see here, phase one was completed. That's what our data today is, is uh, summarizing. Phase two, we did uh, the first year of that last year. The data for that will be coming in in June. And we are about to complete phase two this summer coming up. So we're, we're well into this project, but it was very important to break it up so that it aligned with other campus construction. And not that you should read this in detail, but just to show how carefully this was split up and it moved from right to left. So it moved back toward our main central plant, which is on the left there, as we worked our way through each of these years of construction. So what are the outcomes? What have we seen from that phase one data, which really concluded last June um, we, we do our uh, data accounting every fiscal year, which ends for us on June 30th. 
So we will expect more progress, uh, but this is phase one. This is a bit of a geeky engineering graph that Mitch and I love to look at um, all the time, which shows what our coefficient of performance is. And this may not mean a lot to, to the non-engineers on the call, but this is the efficiency of the heat pump when it's in a prime season, like spring and fall, that it can exchange a lot of energy. We have places that need heat right now, and we have places that need air conditioning. So this is the perfect season to look at how efficient the system is. But a better way to look at it is to compare it um, to things that are more familiar. So if you think about a home furnace, a fairly efficient home furnace, the red dots here are how much fuel you put into that furnace, and the blue dots are how much energy you get out of it. You have a little bit of a loss, not much, but a little bit of a loss through that equipment. It's 90% efficient, let's say. The Carlton steam boilers are even less efficient. Uh, they are about 70% efficient. So for every 10 units of energy in, we get about seven units out. And we have losses in the piping. We have losses in the plant. We have losses in the building. Um, it's a very high energy intense uh, function. So the losses are also commensurately a little bit high. The heat pump using the geothermal bore fields as sort of a thermal battery looks more like this. So this is the peak efficiency. But you know, this we have seen in the spring and the fall up to a 650% efficiency in the graph I just showed you, where for every 10 units of fuel in, we're getting much, much more out. And, and even if we're just operating kind of in a non-peak, it's still about 400% efficient compared to 70%, which was what our steam boilers were operating at. And how does this affect campus outcomes? Well, we are, all, are always looking at the amount of energy used per square foot. How energy intense is our campus? And we had struggled with a lot of conservation projects and upgraded equipment to try to push that under 100 kBTUs of energy per square foot. You can see on the far right here, in 2020, we dramatically plunged from an average of 110 to 76 kBTUs per square foot because we were able to recycle so much energy using the geothermal system. And cost-wise, we've seen about a 20% drop in cost uh, relative to a five-year average. That's primarily, again, just kind of uh, more efficient operation, fuel savings. So we're really seeing this payoff in energy efficiency and cost savings. The way we modeled those cost savings showed us that this project, the green line on the page here, even though we have a, a fairly steep capital expenditure up front, the operating costs are so much uh, less, both in staffing and just the maintenance that we do and the utilities, which are all included here, that the incremental cost of transitioning our whole district energy system would actually break even with the cost of maintaining business as usual with steam. And we, we calculated that break, break even point at 19 to 20 years, but that's a fairly conservative um, model. And we think that this break even point will come even sooner because of the efficiency we're seeing in the actual data. And last but not least, everyone wonders, what did this cost? This project overall was a $42 million project, which is quite significant for Carleton. But again, because we were doing the science building construction, we had a financing mechanism and we rolled the utility plan into our financing for the science project. We also, by aligning this with the science project, were able to cost share with that project. So the three buildings affected by the science renovation and new construction were not included in the utility master plan cost. We were able to piggyback off of the existing plan to do the science project. And also over this past seven year period, we have been careful to align any other planned renovation and construction with our utility work. So that likewise, we're able to align those projects and share costs as well. So that kind of concludes the overview. Um, this is just a fun uh, recognition that we've been operating for 111 years on steam. And as of this Friday, 2 p.m. precisely, we will be turning off our last steam boiler for the last time at Carleton and beginning our summer construction. always the the first and most important question jay why why would we do this 
um, Carlton had entered a phase of a, a really planful phase where we had done a new strategic plan in 2010 that led to the facilities plan that said, okay, if this is our strategy and our program for the next you know, 10 to 20 years, what, what do our buildings need to do for us? And that then led to how do our utilities need to support those buildings? So we were in a very good place with a really strong administration that had been very planful. And so we felt confident moving forward with something this big and it merged all those goals into one maintenance, you know, forward looking uh, technologies and carbon emissions reductions. So that was really important. And then of course, the second thing was it aligned with some other major capital construction. So the timing for us was perfect um, to set ourselves up for the future, flexibility in staffing and flexibility in technology for the future. Carbon neutrality goal, it's a phased process. And, the, and some of the technologies that will end up getting us there may not even exist yet. So for us to take 70% of our load and, and move it to this geothermal heat exchange is really where we are at this moment in time. And those boilers um, that we use for peaking are still running on natural gas, but we're already exploring how to expand the geothermal system, how to get more heat recovery across campus from other sources. Um, and even looking at you know, substitute fuels. So we just feel like each step of this, this journey opens up, we're trying to open up avenues of flexibility to achieve that carbon neutrality goal. If we had made the decision to stay on steam, we would be committed to steam and committed to 100% natural gas for the next 70 years. So each decision is a step toward the goal. So I'll briefly touch on three things. Uh, schedule, the excavation, horizontal boring on a, an existing 150 year old campus, and then selection of the vertical well drillers and the horizontal boring subcontractors. A uh, schedule as Martha and Tim both talked about, uh, we were tasked with trying to fit in a lot of work over the course of the summers as to try and stay out of the academic calendar, which typically meant that uh, we wouldn't start work until after uh, graduation and reunion. So the third week in June, and then for the most part, try and get everything back up and running by the end of August, uh, very early in September. And if overall with schedule, if, if I can stress anything, it's plan and then plan on those plans and then plan on those plans. Um, it was exhausting at times, but it paid off in spades. Um, we were also tasked with keeping disturbances at a minimum on site. Uh, even though most of the students were off during the summer, there were some activities there. There's international students that stayed year round. Uh, so a lot of coordination with logistics plans, uh, temporary provisions. Um, and then jumping back again to uh, the work occurring over the summer, you have to plan for long days. A lot of our days were 12 to 14 hours. Uh, a lot of weeks were, were five to six to even seven days long, which is outside normal construction. So we had to have a, a staffing plan that aligned with that. Um, again, back to the planning, the communication, uh, develop a plan, uh, plan on that, and then plan again. Uh, most of the work was outside. So weather was always a wild card. And we developed a, a milestone schedule overall to bookend the work. But then we also had weekly work plans and daily huddles. And uh, kudos to Martha and Mitch, who were lockstep with us every uh, at every one of those. And if we ever ran into trouble, they were, they were certainly there helping us come up with solutions uh, as a team. Um, despite the best contingency plans, uh, things always come up. Uh, everybody has to practice some flexibility in order to make it happen. Uh, excavation horizontal boring on a 150 year old campus. Uh, as most people probably know, there's, there's old surveys, there's old drawings. Uh, we do, did our best to review every one of those. Um, we did spend a lot of time doing locates. Uh, after the locates were done, we spent a lot of time and money on potholing using back trucks and other methods so that we could ensure uh, what was on the drawings, what uh, was what we found on site. Uh, you use those as from highest risk down to lowest risk. So you would start with your, your high voltage, uh, work down into your gas and then storm sanitary and domestic water, uh, not forgetting about low voltage, which is 
the most important thing to the students so you don't disrupt their Netflix stream. Um, despite all those efforts, uh, 150 year old campus, not everything's gonna be documented. So you do again, have to plan for every contingency for what you may find. And as Martha and Mitch can attest, we did find some treasure, um, some of it some of it we, we, we anticipated a little bit, some of it we did not. Um, so again, going back to the planning phase, you have to have something uh, that everybody agrees to. If, if you run into the situation, you can act quickly and everybody on site knows what to do. Um, we also made more disruptions than any drawings will ever show. Uh, there's little blocks on the plans that show that you excavate here, you excavate there. The actual footprint to execute the work is always much bigger uh, than anticipated. And so you, again, you have to have contingency plans around that as well. A lot of off-site stockpiling of materials, which people didn't typically anticipate. And I'll share some pictures here in a bit to show you that. Uh, the vertical well drilling and the horizontal boring, most of the scopes in relation to this work were bigger than any of the local subcontractors could support. When it came to the vertical well drilling, we had to go national and find um, petroleum subcontractors that we're used to doing wells of this depth and the amount over the summer. And those folks operate as kind of a traveling circus. They show up on site and they want to work uh, dawn to dusk and sometimes a lot later. They want to get the work done and then pack up and move on. And that was something that was a little bit new to all of us. Um, but they were they were a great, a great group. Um, there's not enough time here to go through all the stories, but definitely a different breed, but amazing people. Uh, the horizontal boring, there's a lot of folks locally that can push a two to four inch pipe underground. What we found is there's there aren't many that can push 10 to 14 inch pipe. That's a, an entirely different animal. Uh, and we found that out very quickly. Uh, I'll talk about that in the pros and cons a little bit later too. Um, but you wanna spend a lot of diligence uh, scoping out those folks, making sure they understand what they're getting into. Um, when you have to you have to push out over 300 or 500 feet and pull back a pipe that's 10 inches uh, in diameter and back through the ground uh, through an existing 150 year old establishment. It takes a lot and experience is key. I mean, I think from a pro standpoint, um, that early team engagement, I, I can't tell you how much it really impacted the, the project, whether it was impactful for Carlton or the design team to have that full team engaged early on to help with the planning and the design effort. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier on, um, I, I would love to say that the way we originally had planned the project was exactly how it went. Uh, we had to be nimble. We had to be uh, uh, flexible in that whole process. So that early team engagement, I think, was, was definitely beneficial and, and provided success for the project. Um, as far as the cons go, and, and I won't speak for Martha, but I had some sleepless nights thinking about budgets, thinking about estimates of the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. Did we have enough? Did we have enough coverage in there? So, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy that at the end of five years, we're on track with the budget and, and there's alignment there. Uh, but yeah, there was, there was some, some sleepless nights along the way, making sure that, uh, that we had everything covered or, or included in that. So it's... Uh, it's one of those things I would definitely spend more time and bring those specialists in early, whether it's subcontractors or specialty trades to provide more, uh, more input for those estimates. Definitely the, the pros would be, um, would be the amount of planning and the amount of meetings and the amount of um, consensus between the group prior to starting any of the activities. I would do even more of it. It, it seems at times it's painful. It's hard to get everybody on board um, from the subcontracting standpoint because they're just not used to that level of involvement but it, it paid off in spades time and time again um, and then I think by the time we were done everybody agreed that it was it was the best approach um, the cons and I told Mitch I probably wouldn't say it but I'm going to we had a we had a miss with our horizontal boring subcontractor the first one that we brought on uh, we learned a lot of painful lessons from that the one being uh, spending more time uh, with that division of work to ensure that they they have the skill set necessary to execute the work. Um, we won't do that again. Um, I think something I would do again that's probably unique to my perspective is all the outreach, the effort that we spent on outreach, the graphic designer that we hired to help us explain these technologies, and then my collaborator in the sustainability office, who's really an outreach focused um, role. 
was really important to both easing our way through this campus disruption, letting people know what was going on, and also in instilling a sense of intrigue and interest and excitement and pride. And we've found that all the materials we produced for outreach during the project are really serving us well now as we're doing webinars like this and talking to other schools about our project. Um, and the other thing I would really do again is this alignment with other planned construction. That was really key to our ability to do this as quickly as we did it and to finance it the way we did it and also get the buy-in from the campus community. Um, the other thing, the things that I would not do again, I think we drilled down really specifically in our 30 year cost model and we got down to kind of like a specific dollar amount early. And then of course, as we learned things, as we evolved the project, as we uh, remembered certain items, you know, that we had to check off that those numbers changed. And so I think looking back, I would have really presented in a way that showed ranges, big round numbers, you know, kind of moving the needle from you know green to yellow to red rather than drilling down too specifically too soon in the in the planning i also would not if i did it again underestimate what we would need for temporary conditions like mitch said we had an operating campus we had to provide hot showers whether or not there was steam to the building and so we spent a certain amount of money on some temporary conditions to get us through, to, to enable construction to start a little earlier or go a little later in the summer to get all the work done. And that, that, was, that became an important part of the project that I don't think we anticipated well enough up front. Good. Would, I would definitely do again, as I spent a fair amount of time, Martha and I both did with a controls contractor and I don't think when we started this project, we realized how much the controls are going to be integrated across campus. It used to be our control system would operate a building. And now because we're running two different energy plants and we're running on the opposite ends of campus and the, the information has to be gathered from eight to 10 buildings to balance loads and balance boilers and, and where the heat pumps are at. Um, having a controls contractor that really understands and can, and can grasp what all that means Fortunately, we, we went with one that had done a project similar to this before, and it made the transition a lot easier. You know, as with anything, there's hiccups when you start and having the right person on site to understand how that new heat pump system is supposed to operate and the timing of the valves and switches is, is huge. So I would definitely make sure I had, a, I had the right person for that. As far as what I wouldn't do, I, I think some of that is um, we underestimated what it would take and we would need to do a better job of calculating how much steam we need in localized spots, in particular as our kitchens. Uh, we had to continue to try to operate. We didn't change kitchen equipment, so we had to put in localized steam for a dish machine or steam kettles or warmers and those types of things. And um, I think we just kind of missed there a little bit. And I think we would probably do a better job of vetting out what we really need for steam pressure and, and volume in those areas, the things we weren't going to remove as steam. From, from a sustainability standpoint, what, you know, whether it's our clients in, in higher ed or healthcare or corporate or, or even in mis, you know, municipalities, uh, we're still we're seeing a lot of sustainability tied in with the infrastructure. Um, you know, and, and Mitch talked about earlier the aging infrastructure, uh, deferred maintenance. You know, it comes down to that singular question: Do you repair it or do you replace it? Um, and if you replace, do you replace in kind or do you transition to something more efficient, whether it's technologies or, or systems? Um, what are the benefits? Does it make sense? You know, whether it's financially or operations or maintenance wise, um, we're seeing a lot of integration of renewables, uh, obviously for the carbon emission reduction uh, piece. Um, as Martha mentioned, you know, the, the continued requests for analysis of energy use reduction opportunities. And that's, that's by building, that's by system um, and improvements that can come from those types of, of applications. Um, you know, recently we've seen, um, you know, clients really uh, evaluated resiliency uh, and some portion of self-reliance in kind of an ever-changing environment. Uh, Mitch talked about it with the, with the propane air system to provide, uh, again, more of a self-reliance and, and off-grid approach to them. Um, we saw it with uh, Texas Cold Snap, that how much that impacted uh, not just people, but an entire state. Uh, we saw it with a pipeline shutdown out east. And so that that resiliency, we're seeing more and more clients really uh, driving towards that and, and seeing, okay, if we're gonna do that, what are some sustainable things that we can do as a part of that? Um, you know, the bottom line, I, I think for McGough, it, it really comes down to helping, you know, the owners and the clients develop that information and the narrative. 
uh, to make those critical decisions, you know, maximizing the benefits where we can um, for both the short-term and, and long-term outlooks as well.